so pleased to be here today uh, with Brian, who's going to be co-moderating with me. Brian? Hello, everyone. My name is Brian King. I am Kenyan. I am 18 years old. I am a journalist from Tottenham International, and I am co-facilitating with Christine. Hi. Wonderful. Um, and we have a fantastic panel of speakers and panelists, and we're really hoping that this session is going to be really interactive. Um, so thank you very much to all of our audience um, who are here and to all of to the Alliance and who is um, obviously uh, welcomed us to convene this session today. Um, just before we get uh, started off. Um, so as you as many of you may know, um, the topic of accountability to children in humanitarian action is one of the four key priorities of the Alliance's strategic plan for the 2021-2025 period. Um, and the way it's framed, I just wanted to uh, remind us of the way it's framed in the Alliance strategy as we kick off this session. Um, the goal of uh, accountability to children as it's framed in the Alliance strategy is all humanitarian programs are accountable to children and ensure that they're meaningful and equitable participation. So um, this is a very um, critical and crucial, um, and I would even say foundational element to the humanitarian system in general, accountability to affected populations is really a core principle of the humanitarian, um, the way in which the humanitarian uh, sector um, makes commitments to the populations that it serves. Um, and, um, and what the Alliance is trying to do, and particularly through the strategy and through the concept of the centrality of children and their protection in humanitarian action, the, um, the Alliance and all of us who are involved in this work is really trying to um, ensure that accountability to children is everyone's responsibility. It's the responsibility of actors from all different humanitarian sectors, not just the child protection sector. And this is really reinforced by um, by the graphic and the um, the uh, the illustration and the narrative that was just launched on Monday in the um, opening session. So um, with that, I was just going to pop the uh, the graphic and the um, the link to the graphic uh, in. In the chat box so that um because this is the overarching theme of the whole alliance meeting the centrality of children and their protection humanitarian action and we hope the discussion today with our panelists can think about what does this mean for accountability and how can we in the child protection sector reinforce accountability across all humanitarian sectors so with that i hand over to brian to get us kicked off with some mentimeters thank you so much christine um uh... Well, you guys have now been introduced to the topic of uh, the today, accountability to children. I want to introduce you guys to some few questions and I want you to guys to just react in the chat using a scale of one to five. Well, one, one is not at all. And five is very, very, very much, you know. So a scale of one to five, the first question is, to what extent is your organization project prioritizing accountability to children? I'll repeat. To what extent is your organization or project prioritizing accountability to children? Now on a scale of one to five, you know, one being not prioritizing at all and five being extremely prioritizing, like you're very, you're very much prioritizing accountability to children. Just react on the chat before we introduce the next question. I'll give you guys roughly 30 seconds, just on a scale of one to five. Choose a number, one being not at all, five being very, very much great. All right, I see some people reacting already. And I want us to go to the next question so that we can react together, right? Um, now the next question, the next question is still using the same scale, one to five, one being not at all and five being very, very much. Next question is, what challenges do you or your organization experience in being accountable to children in humanitarian programming? Right. So what challenges do you or your organization experience in being accountable to children in humanitarian programming? Sorry, I forgot to mention this one. You might have to type down the challenge in itself, right? Because uh, reacting on a scale won't really work. So why don't you tell us? Just be brief and tell us what kind of challenges do you or your organization experience in being accountable to children in humanitarian programming? I'm just going to give you a few seconds to just uh, type it down on the chat and send to us so I can see. Let me just open the chat and say exactly. Feel free to share any words to describe any challenges you feel. You can share one word, a statement, if you feel like that will describe it more. Uh, 
uh, a picture i don't know i don't know if a picture works but you just share whatever you feel like will describe the challenge in itself that you face when trying to be accountable to children like for example if you reacted with one saying that you are not accountable to children at all maybe you can also tell us why is that is there a challenge that is preventing you from being accountable to your children like you personally or the organization you represent is there a challenge in itself that is preventing you from being accountable to children okay great 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 i will repeat the question again challenges that you or your organization experience in being accountable to children in humanitarian programming and i can even just tweak it a bit maybe let's say you said one meaning you're not accountable to children at all which is terrible and we're hoping at the end you'll be changing that but you can tell us like what are some of the reasons that maybe stopping you from being accountable to children you know is it policy in your area is it um the cost of accountability because in itself is a challenge so maybe you can tell us what exactly is stopping you or maybe you just didn't feel like it so uh you can also tell, tell just type it down and oh like i see right. some of you yeah have you seen some of the the responses that are coming through there's some really interesting responses as well yeah I'm, I'm i can see like someone here actually mentioned the problem of resources and the lack of collaboration of relative ministries in itself those are two different challenges resources being something else and the lack of collaboration of relative ministries being another challenge um challenges that we're going to be addressing uh with the next speakers who are going to come in right now and uh, you guys just continue reacting continue sending them through and i want to introduce you guys to the next two speakers who are going to be addressing uh different issues that we have been addressing that we have pointed out here including maybe some of your reactions we are going to be hearing from you but i am very pleased to welcome our keynote speakers uh one of them being minha Pashel, the director of child protection climate and environment in at save the children uh minha you're going to tell me if i pronounce that try a bit later but we are also going to be introducing elise Elise Shah. Again, pronunciation might be an issue, but she's also one of our keynote speakers and she's the research manager at Ground Truth Solutions. I want to welcome uh, Minha to start of all, to start us, but uh, Elise will be joining us a bit later. Welcome in here and tell us if we pronounce your name right. I'm fine with any pronunciation. It's Minya, but it's uh, anything is fine. I'm used to many different ones. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start, I think me and Elise, we are going to try to frame a little bit and uh, this uh, the session and as well as maybe asking or showing a little bit some provocative uh, issues perhaps. And I think as self-reflection is really important for accountability, I might be most critical perhaps to my own organization. Um, so accountability to children and their protection is found in many areas and can be addressed through a number of angles and approaches. So what is it that we are talking about? Is it about strengthening children's rights through law reforms or ensuring perpetrators don't get away with violating, neglecting and abusing children? Is it to develop a safeguarding system for human child workers? Or is it a process through which, which children's voices are listened to and taken into? Or perhaps all of this and more. So accountability could be seen as a control mechanism to prevent and address arbitrary exercise of power and should include children being able to hold their duty bearers to account, whether they are the parents, the state, peacekeeping operations, or the humanitarian community. And accountability is not an end in itself. It is supposed to lead to improvement in children's lives and secure their ability to have a say on how they're being governed and how we as humanitarian community are upholding their rights and responding to their needs, both in the immediate and in the long So over the last decades, there has been an increasing awareness of the need to protect children in conflict also among states, um, as for instance, the recent Oslo Conference on Children and Armed Conflict is one example of. During this conference, 80 states were represented and made commitments. Already in or already, but in 1996, the first independent study on the impact of armed conflict on children, led by Gareth Michel, was published. This report, for instance, resulted in the Office of the Special Representative of Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict being set up, and with resolutions followed, leading to, for instance, the annual publication of the Secretary General's name and shame reports on perpetrators of grave violations against children, an important milestone. Other milestones 
are the development of humanitarian minimum standards, which Joanna is going to talk a bit about, and in particular, the development and revision of the minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action, as well as the launch of the core humanitarian standard. That was 2012 and 2014. And both of these clearly spell out what we as humanitarian actors should be accountable to. Also, earlier on, and triggered by allegations of sexual exploitation and abuse by UN peacekeepers, policies were developed to uphold accountability to children amongst peacekeepers. However, in peacekeeping operations, it is from the mandate that the roles and responsibilities of peacekeepers are determined. If the mandate does not define roles and responsibilities for them, in relation to child protection, those responsibilities cannot be assigned to them. And then it's practically impossible to hold them accountable. So accountability in peacekeeping operations happens when there is commitment, policy and procedural guidelines, monitoring, oversight, and complaints mechanisms that are known and accessible and followed up on. So many components are needed to ensure accountability. Another component for the humanitarian community that we as child protection actors love to talk about and preach is the importance of children's participation. And this is where I become a bit critical to my own organization because when we are put on the spot, how well are we doing that? At the Oslo conference, um, and while it was a really positive event in so many ways, we also had the opportunity to bring children to the table as we had managed to do at previous high level meetings. For instance, the Pan-African Conference on Children and Conflict last year. At that conference, the contribution of children was raised as the most important element by participants. And for instance, the child representatives requested changes to the agenda to accommodate stronger participation from them. So for instance, that they were given the possibility to comment a question, the panelists, alongside the whole conference and not only at the end. And that was also done. There were therefore really high expectations on the Oslo conference to continue that positive development and possibly even raise that bar. And as we heard in the welcome speech, many participants were really happy with how children's voices kept reminding them on the purpose and focus. However, while their voices were featured through videos and recordings, which was seen as a safer option than bringing them there, the children themselves were not quite as happy and did not feel heard. They had expected to be there in person, to contribute directly to the discussions and to even lead some of the sessions as they did at the Pan-African Conference thereby having the chance to directly hold organizations and member states to account. And physical participation is not the solution to everything and it's not always appropriate or safe. But we should also not underestimate the dynamics that can occur through direct dialogue between children and due to bears. And in the end of the day, Oslo is probably a safer place than Nairobi. So how can we support one another and hold ourselves accountable to keep pushing that bar? How can we together ensure that we have the proper expertise, precautions and safety nets to facilitate children's meaningful participation? All in all, the humanitarian community needs to work across all components that together ensure accountability mechanisms for children. And that requires from us, in addition to understanding how children themselves would like to participate, perseverance, advocacy and working across sectors. With other words, the centrality of children's protection throughout all the pieces that make up the prevention and response to neglect, exploitation, abuse, and violence against children. Thank you. And handing back to you, Brian. Thank you so much, Minhia. That was so informative. You know, I, I, I actually, I was a bit worried that five minutes won't be enough to talk about the topic. But I love how you mentioned that without proper assignment of roles, it is impossible to track accountability and to actually hold anyone accountable. Thank you so much, Mia. That was so informative, so powerful. I love that. I will definitely reach out, reach out, uh, just to talk a bit more about that. But that is awesome, and thank you so much. Um, next, after Mia has just like educated us and shared a beautiful piece of information with us, I want to welcome another awesome person, Madam Elise Shear. The sorry. Madam Elise Shear, the research manager at Ground Truth Solutions, who also has something beautiful to tell us. So welcome, Elise. What do you have for us today? Thanks, Brian. I hope it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> but my thinking on this question of accountability to children as a collective responsibility really stems from our study of children's perceptions of humanitarian assistance in Burkina Faso. Um, so before I get into that, a little bit of background, I think as many 
know on this call, children make up over half sometimes of people in need in humanitarian responses. But in general, as was just shared by Minha, their opinions on what they need are not being sought out systematically to inform humanitarian programming. And this is no different in Burkina Faso, where Ground Truth Solutions has a project um, where children make up 55% of those categorized as people in need. So we had started our programming in Burkina Faso in 2020, and the child protection subcluster kept reaching out to us as we were doing our programming with adults saying, you really need to include the perceptions of children. Um, you're leaving them out in your studies. If you're just asking adults what they think about uh, humanitarian assistance, you really need to include them. So over the course of last year in 2022, we worked with child protection experts and Burkina Faso-based local organizations to design and implement a child-friendly methodology, which my colleague Bruno will share more about in the panel discussion. And the idea was really to understand what are children's priorities in this context um, and how can humanitarians better support their goals and their dreams for their future. And this was a really wonderful collaboration with a bunch of different organizations, including Terre des Hommes, Espat France, National Coordination of Associations for Children and Young Workers in Burkina Faso, Humanity and Inclusion, Plan International, of course, the Child Protection Subcluster, and the Ministry for Humanitarian Affairs in Burkina Faso. And almost none of the findings from this study point to the child protection subcluster needing to do more or do, do specific things. Rather, what children are asking for requires all humanitarians to take young people into consideration throughout their activities, even if their programming only targets adults. So I want to give you three quick examples, and again, Bruno might go into more detail later. But the first finding is that children do not think the humanitarian response is for them and don't think their opinions matter. So obviously this is not an issue that the child protection cluster can solve. This requires all implementing organizations to meaningfully engage with children before, during, and after a project. And like I said, this goes for organizations that are only targeting adult populations, because as we know, in crisis context, children already take on a lot of responsibilities in their household, maybe more than they would otherwise. And so they're very likely directly or indirectly impacted by all aid and services being provided in their community. So it's crucial that aid providers understand how their programming might impact children and then adapt it as needed to their needs and preferences. The second key finding was that children do not really know what's happening in their community um, in, the, in the regions that we studied in Burkina Faso. They don't really know what organizations are working there and they don't know how to get information about the humanitarian assistance being provided, though they do say that they tend to prefer face-to-face -face communication with adults they trust. So what does this require? This requires all implementing organizations to first improve their communication with the adults in the community because children will go to their parents to their caregivers and those they trust for information and if adults don't know what's going on they can't tell their children this also requires all implementing organizations to have ways of sharing information with children in a child-friendly way uh, and that's the responsibility of all all implementing organizations even those only working with adults and the last key finding was that children describe verbal and physical violence at distribution sites and undignified conditions. So again, this is the responsibility of all organizations who are distributing goods to ensure that the goods or the services provided are provided in a safe and dignified way. Because again, even if it's... Uh... Uh, oh, I can see it. Hear the French. Super. Um, even if goods and services are targeting adults, children will be there at distribution sites and will be impacted by what's going on. So I want to close with just two quick questions for people to contemplate as we continue with this panel. First is who should be responsible for helping children understand that they have a right to have a say? Um, is this rights-based education, is this um, type of education something that only child protection specialists should do? Because it surely takes time, requires building trust with children, um, or is this the responsibility of everyone? And then also based on what Minha said, there's a lot of chatter about participation at the global level. And there's a lot of chatter about how it shouldn't be about us having children or even adults participate in our activities. We should be participating in what they're doing, what they want. And so practically speaking, what does this mean when we're talking about children? How should we as the broader humanitarian community um, get involved in what children want and are doing themselves? 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elise. I mean, I personally love the fact that you gave us questions. <laughs> so yes, everyone reflect on that a bit. And the, when it comes to the topic of dignity in itself, that is something I've actually had to handle my own, like by myself, because when you're distributing the, like simple things like dignity packs, a child wants us to, what is the point of distributing dignity packs if you're not, if you're taking away our dignity when doing it, you know? It's very important to maintain dignity even when distributing um, the products, whatever you when humanitarian action has to be dignified, especially when it comes to children. Thank you so much, Elise. That was very, very informative. And uh, to you all, to all of you guys who are here today, I know you're enjoying the conversation as much as I am. Personally, I love I love moderating, but this is awesome. I am getting a lot of information. My notes are <laughs> almost filled, but um, because of time and because Elise and Miha have taken us through such an awesome discussion. I want just to go into an even deeper discussion like that, something even more powerful with more questions and more people. And I want to hand over back to Christine, who's going to take us through our final discussion. Christine, back to you. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, thank you for the moderation of the, the keynote speakers. And thanks so much to Minya and Elise for really setting out the, some of the big questions and the big issues about why this is critical. Why is it that accountability to children in humanitarian action is everyone's responsibility? Um, and, um, and I would just like to also particularly um, pick up on what the point that Elise um, concluded with that question, that invitation for us to think about how do we as a broader humanitarian community get involved in the activities that children want? This is, I think, a very important question that hopefully um, maybe we will um, hear from our panelists um, more uh, in detail. So um, with that, I would like to pass over to our panelists. So we have, we're joined by three brilliant panelists today. Two of them are from the child protection sector and one of them is from a different sector, so the education sector. Um, and we're going to hear from each of them for five minutes and then we're going to open up to a Q&A. Um, so um, first I would like to introduce Joanna Wedge who is the, um, the CPMS working group co-lead um, and is based with UNICEF. Um, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kristen. It's lovely to come after the keynote speakers um, and you know be learning and listening uh, to them as, as they bring some good questions and some good points forward. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, as for those of you who don't know me, I co-lead the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group at the global level for the Alliance itself. Um, and I'm seconded by UNICEF to that effort. So I'm going to be talking about using the CPMS itself as a tool for accountability to children that we work with. So as we know, most of us, hopefully everyone, you know, has a copy, either an app or a hard copy of our beloved CPMS handbook. But for more than a decade now, the CPMS have been the child protection sector's backbone. They provide a shining light, I would say, to how to improve the quality of programming, of our advocacy, of our administrative procedures. But like all the other humanitarian standards, sphere, IE, et cetera, the purpose of the CPMS is to improve both quality and accountability. So we know what we are accountable for, the implementation of these minimum standards, but do we reflect much on who we're accountable to? We're certainly accountable to each other. Uh, as members of the Alliance, we have our annual self-assessment exercise using the CPMS. The CPMS help us focus on our accountability to our donors and trying to reach a level of programming with their support. We're accountable to government counterparts in the countries where we operate, whether that be social services or um, public health and so on. But the common humanitarian standard that we all use in the humanitarian world calls for us to be accountable to affected people or the AAP, um, some have already mentioned this. And it's clear that the people most affected by our work are indeed the boys and girls and non-binary children whom we serve. As has been mentioned, sometimes in a given population, 40, 50, 60% of people are in fact children and we need to be accountable to them. So at the CPMS Working Group, we've been pondering how can we use this big handbook, this comprehensive set of standards 
and principals to improve our accountability to children in their great diversity, meeting them where they're at, finding out what they need, what they think. So first of all, let me take a step back. Did you know that in the 2019, in updating the previous edition of the CPMS in 2019, we actually included 245 children. We reached out and did consultations asking for their perspectives on different aspects of the CPMS. We facilitated those consultations in part because, as we know, we're, we tend to have expertise <clears throat> excuse me, in children's participation though we don't want that expertise to only stay in our sector, but for it to go through the whole humanitarian community. But accountability goes further than participation or consultation. Yeah, We need to be clear and creative when we discuss with children how we see ourselves upholding what is a complex and technical set of standards. You know, indeed, when we ourselves as child protection practitioners are new to the CPMS, it takes some time to absorb them and to put them into action. So we're thinking that accountability to affected children mean we as individual practitioners and as organizations, child protection organizations and other humanitarian organizations must co-create a humanitarian system where children feel safe and valued. So this is a step-by-step -step process, a decision-by-decision -decision process, and a response-by-response -response process and journey. It means that we um, need to build on all 10 of our CPHA principles. I lost my notes. Um, which set the framework for the 28 minimum standards that we use um, in the handbook itself. So, But beyond the principles, there are other obvious entry points to unpack accountability to children. Within the CPMS, we have, for example, standard one on coordination, always a key one. Um, standard four on our program cycle management and looking how we can be accountable to children through the various stages of our programming. But children themselves are probably processed to improve in more concrete ways where we intervene, uh, perhaps on accountability to children who need alternative care, our standard 19, or on case management, standard 18, and many, many others. So accountability to children for us means stepping into discussions and concrete collaboration with other sectors, which has been mentioned by our two previous speakers, uh, our pillar four of the CPMS uh, gives us the structure to do that by uh, pairing us with our counterparts in nutrition, in education, in um, shelter, and looking at what is common guidance, what are common key steps, what are common um, indicators. Um, and also we mustn't forget our common humanitarian standards together across the humanitarian sector has us working with, um, has us working to the highest degree of collaboration. We also see, I think we can point to some of these discussions around accountability to children, beginning with our education colleagues, which is our standard 23. So at the global level, as part of our contribution to the Alliance strategy um, and its priority on accountability to children, the CPMS Working Group is starting to explore how our set of standards can play a central role in improving our sector's accountability to children and with humility and through learning our lessons well, role model to other humanitarian actors how their approaches might be improved. We know that two important age and stage appropriate aspects are awareness of the CPMS and similarly accessibility to the CPMS. So turning to kind of Elise's point about meeting children where they're at and engaging with them and what they're doing, we've supported agencies in a number of countries to develop with children's input, a storybook about the minimum standards about child protection in humanitarian settings and the idea of standards, um, a set of posters, and illustrations. And I would really encourage everyone here to go on the CPMS page within the Alliance website and look for that visual gallery, that art gallery of so many interesting images. Some of them, as I said, designed by children themselves. So going forward, the working group would like to explore with you the efficacy of games with children, songs with children, and other accessibility enhanced approaches to unpack the minimum standards with children of all ages and stages of development. 
and to pledge to them and monitor through them our work of the highest quality. So we want whatever tools we have, the existing storybooks, games that we may develop, et cetera, to enable a conversation with children about which of our interventions most urgently need improvement, how they would measure success in meeting those standards, what should happen if we can't meet those targets, and how should reporting be done. So whether, for those of you on the call, whether you're a donor, operational agency, an academic, an advocacy group, please consider joining us at the Alliance's CPMS Working Group in exploring over the next year or so how to best bring our sector's central tool, the CPMS, closer to the people we serve, children affected by humanitarian crises. I don't know if I'm passing back to Kristen. Yes, great, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanna, for that very clear and, um, and, and, and real, real call to action, you know, the clear call to action that this is a collaborative effort and that we all have a role to play. Um, I'm putting the um, the website of the CPMS uh, working group um, in, in the chat so that others can consult it and also take a look at um, some of the tools that you've also mentioned. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's, um, and, and if anyone has any questions, please do uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, we will also be going to a Q&A afterwards. Um, but before we do that, we're going to hear from our two other panelists. So it's now my pleasure to pass over to Bruno Nebi, who is my colleague at Terre des Hommes. Uh, Bruno is a monitoring and evaluation um, coordinator at uh, in our office in Burkina Faso at Terre des Hommes. Bruno will be speaking in French. So I invite you all to, um, if you would like the French translation, um, just pop over to the little globe at the bottom of your screen and click it and you should and click the English channel. So you hear the French translator translating into English. And Bruno will be speaking a in a little bit more in depth about the, the pieces of work that uh, Elise mentioned about and our collaboration with Ground Truth Solutions and some other organizations in Burkina Faso. So over to you, Bruno. Bruno, tu es sur mute. Exact. Alors, merci bien. Et à la suite de mes de prédécesseurs, je voulais juste partager un peu avec vous une expérience sur de la rénovabilité au Burkina Faso. Next slide. Alors, cette expérience a consisté exactement en quoi il s'est agi, n'est-ce pas, de l'étude dont euh, Elise avait tantôt parlé. Et on voudrait ess essentiellement, en fait, partager l'approche méthodologique un peu avec vous. Et donc, concrètement, qu'en est-il? Qu est donc, l'étude visait à capter les préoccupations ou les ressentis des enfants par rapport à l'aide humanitaire. Et donc, à ce titre, nous avons développé une, il nous fallait développer une méthodologie qui soit appropriée aux enfants pour pouvoir justement capter ces éléments. Et cette méthodologie, c'était quoi C'était une approche qualitative euh, de focus group centrée vraiment sur la cartographie inductive de l'environnement des enfants. Et pour cela, il nous a fallu en fait de la multidisciplinarité, et j'insiste sur ce mot, pour capitaliser en fait, n'est-ce pas, les exercices spécifiques. Pourquoi parce que, justement, il nous fallait quand même calibrer cette démarche exploratoire et déductive, mais surtout, il nous fallait mettre au cœur toutes les questions qui sont liées à l'éthique, à la sauvegarde et au biais pour pouvoir avoir un élément tangible. Donc, concrètement, qu'est-ce qu'il en a été pour la démarche On a d'abord pris le temps d'élaborer un guide et ensuite, nous avons conduit des focus groupes, 31 focus au total, donc chez les enfants de 10 à 13 ans et 14-17 ans, et ça s'est tenu dans six régions, dans neuf communes, et ça concernait 203 enfants. Pour ces, la conduite de ce focus group, l'élément déterminant a été en fait la création de confiance entre justement les acteurs et ceux qui devraient en fait ne pas, les enfants et les enfants plutôt. Et donc, et ça, ça nécessitait vraiment une communication inclusive. Hein, et il nous fallait vraiment du temps pour assurer ce processus-là et garantir justement la qualité des prestations. Next slide. Next slide. Again. OK. Maintenant, de cette démarche-là, qu'est-ce qu'on peut retenir? Ce que les enfants nous ont dit essentiellement. Donc, les enfants ont dit beaucoup de choses qui vont certainement influencer la manière des, des humanitaires d'agir. 
mais on voulait juste partager quelques points avec vous. Et ces points, c'est quoi D'abord, c'est cette connaissance critique importante de ce que les enfants ont de leur contexte. Et ça, c'était assez étonnant. Mais aussi, les enfants sont très critiques par rapport justement à l'organisation de l'aide humanitaire, notamment sur les questions de la communication et de la transparence dans le ciblage. Ils ont aussi un sentiment d'inégalité assez fort par rapport justement à l'aide humanitaire et ils sont très préoccupés par les questions de sécurité et des questions de cohésion sociale. Alors, ils témoignent aussi que leurs opinions n'est pas importante au vu des adultes, alors qu'au même moment, comme on le disait tantôt, ils ont beaucoup d'idées qui peuvent permettre, par exemple, d'améliorer l'aide humanitaire. Next. Next slide. OK, merci. Donc, nous, c'est... Donc, en plus de ce que les enfants ont dit, du point de vue du processus, qu'est-ce que nous, nous avons retenu C'est essentiellement deux éléments. Le premier élément, justement, c'est que c'est la nécessité de mettre ensemble les efforts, de mutualiser vraiment tout ce que nous avons à tous les niveaux. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, il va être difficile de continuer, par exemple, à adresser les questions de redevabilité là, de manière vraiment en silo, de manière cloisonnée. Alors, l'autre chose aussi, c'est la nécessité des ressources, aussi bien en temps, en compétences qu'en argent, justement, pour adapter la question de la redevabilité des organisations aux enfants. Next slide. Maintenant, en perspective et en enjeu, alors c'est beaucoup plus des questions que nous, nous nous posons. Alors, à savoir, comment par exemple garantir la qualité, justement, de tout ce travail qui peut être fait mais avec des ressources limitées. On sait qu'on est dans un contexte aujourd'hui où les ressources sont relativement limitées. Donc, est-ce qu'on ne va pas aller vers des démarches qui sont beaucoup plus light et qui permettent, par exemple, n'est-ce pas, de garantir autant, par exemple, de qualité Et l'autre chose aussi, c'est l'investissement dans le processus de la, de, de la rénovabilité. Est-ce que nous, en tant que maître, nous sommes euh, prêts à investir autant sur le processus de la rénovabilité que, par exemple, dans nos processus d'opération. Et enfin, on voulait aborder quelques enjeux opérationnels sur la mise en, euh, en œuvre. C'est quoi Là, Parmi ces enjeux, c'est par exemple, n'est-ce pas, comment engager les enfants sans, sans pour autant générer des attentes que nous, par exemple, nous ne pourrons pas directement euh, 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 accorder. Ou encore, comment gérer, par exemple, les situations difficiles qui apparaissent au cours de ces, de, de, de ces focus group, quand, par exemple, les, les enfants euh, euh, montrent des, des, des émotions assez difficiles. Et le dernier challenge pour nous, justement, c'est la question de pouvoir boucler la boucle. Ça dit tout ce que nous avons pu faire, il faut que nous puissions retourner ces résultats aux enfants, mais surtout, et surtout, montrer qu'est-ce qui est fait pour améliorer leur situation à partir de leur feedback. Donc, next slide. Donc, voilà ce que je voulais partager un peu avec vous. Et, et les enfants du Burkina Faso vous disent merci pour votre attention soutenue. Merci, Christelle. Merci beaucoup, Bruno. Thank you so much, Bruno. That was a, it was amazing that you were able to cover that content in five minutes, but so many interesting insights um, and several of them I'm, I hope that our audience will pick up on as well in the discussion. Um, and, um, and yeah, really, I really appreciated that, that last piece about that, the feedback loop. How do we complete the loops, you know, when we consult with children, how are we systematically you know, feeding back to them and hearing from them about the work that we've done with them. So such an important piece in um, in a discussion about accountability. Um, thank you so much. And finally, I would like to pass to our third panelist, um, who is Serena Zanella. And uh, Serena is uh, with the Global Education Cluster. And Serena is um, actually, um, sorry, I'm just putting Serena is a child safeguarding accountability specialist with the Global Education Cluster and we're so pleased to have um, colleagues from the education um, sector here with us today to participate in this conversation. So Serena, over to you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Um, as mentioned, I work at the Global Education Cluster and specifically I am the child safeguarding and child participation specialist at the Global Education Cluster which uh, testifies how the global education cluster um, has put a lot of efforts in uh, towards accountability to affected children 
in within the remits of our um, work that is not the delivery of education services as such, which is what um, organizations within education clusters do on the ground. Our focus is coordination of the education sector. And within the remits of coordination, we have created um, guidelines, uh, tools, and I am there to provide technical support to education cluster coordination teams uh, uh, on the ground and their partners in improving accountability to affected children across the humanitarian program cycle. Uh, as far as I know, I've been in post for uh, three years now. There is no other cluster in any other sector that has committed resources, time, given priority to uh, accountability to children with um, the level of resources that the global education cluster has put on child safeguarding and child participation. As you are aware, my predecessor mentioned that both child safeguarding and child participation are not only key components, that participation in particular is a foundation uh, to accountability to affected children. Uh, and uh, in concrete terms, the way we are doing it, as I've mentioned, uh, slightly man rapidly mentioned, is that I've been in place for three years now, I've created guidelines and practical tools that support education cluster coordination teams in their country facilitating child safeguarding or child participation actions within uh, cluster coordination activities with their partners and um, at the child participation level in particular as it has been mentioned in this slide a large focus of my work in the past three years has been creating resources and provide uh, technical, remote and in-person support in consulting children during um, education needs assessment. But I wish to highlight that we do that also in other key phases of the humanitarian program cycle. So I've done this also um, for monitoring purposes and uh, for strategy design purposes. To date, I have supported 12, uh, 11 uh, education clusters consulting children. We have reached, uh, we have consulted in the excess uh, to 3,600 children in less than three years. The, of these 51% are girls and uh, about 1.6% are children with disability. And the beauty of this is that we are taking accountability um, to children at the uh, collective level, which is the purpose also of this conversation because as a cluster, we are there at the collective level. We are not an individual agency. We are not there to deliver specific education programs. We are coordinating the sector. And therefore, our message to, uh, from the global level to cluster, uh, national based education clusters is that child safeguarding, including protection from sexual exploitation and abuse of children, and child participation are collective accountabilities that. Um, should have uh, a dignified place uh, within cluster coordination functions. And I'm happy to notice that some of the issues that my predecessors have mentioned, so whether I can tell you to children uh, should, uh, uh, should be only a remit for the um, child protection sector, or like Bruno mentioned, how to close the feedback loop with children during um, consultative uh, processes, um, or uh, at the Mentimeter, Participants um, are um, have been taken into account by the global education cluster. So, if not all, several of the issues that have been mentioned so far are part of my work, and uh, the global education cluster is working towards improving them to improve accountability to children in our coordinated education responses. Thank you so much, Serena, for sharing us those valuable insights from the perspective of the education sector. Um, and I think um, I think it's 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 
it's critical to look at what's happening, you know, um, around us, certainly for us as child protection, um, those of us who are in the child protection sector. But again, there's many other people here, I think, from other sectors um, in this call. And so it, now we'd like to invite actually um, a discussion, an interactive discussion. We're running slightly behind time. So I think we'll keep the, the Q&A to about 10 minutes. Um, so, but um, yes, uh, we really invite uh, colleagues in the participants who are in the room to please use the chat if you have any questions for our panelists, Joanna, um, uh, if, uh, sorry, I was going to say Elise because I can see you on the screen, but um, obviously we have Elise and Minya who are our keynote speakers. If you have questions for them, you know, feel free to pop them in the chat. But of course we have Joanna, Bruno and Serena who are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I think there was already a question posted a bit earlier, uh, right after Bruno's presentation, I think. Let me just find it. Um, sorry, <laughs> it, it was a bit back, but um, okay, yeah, I, I think a question by Brikena Zogaj. Sorry if I mispronounced that, but I uh, she said that thank you for the honest reflection. I am keen to understand how the research, I think this was for Bruno, how the research findings have informed programming decisions and whether they've had an impact on influencing management and external donors to prioritize child protection. It would be valuable for me to learn more about the link between the research and the actions uh, and the actions taken in this regard. Thank you, Brian, for keeping your eye on the, the Q&A on the chat. I will also translate that into French uh, as well, and I'll pop it in the, 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 um, in the chat box in French as well. Um, so uh, here we go. Don't know. Bruno, je ne sais pas. Alors, j'ai mis la question dans le chat uh, en français. C'est une question par rapport à uh, this question around... Um, oh, Yes, how the results of this research um, have influenced programming decisions, really. And I do encourage all of you to just, uh, Bruno is muted. I do encourage all of you guys to send in your questions right now so that we can actually take advantage of them right here. We have about 10 minutes for you guys to just interact. Sorry, Bruno. Hello, je peux? Oui. Donc, euh, merci à Brian, je crois, pour euh, la, la, la question. Donc, euh, je ne sais pas si j'ai bien compris, Christelle, c'est plusieurs questions. Hein. Comment engager les enfants euh, sans générer des attentes? Désolée, ça c'était, je, je m'excuse, ça c'était, j'ai fait du copier-coller sur DeepL. Sorry, I'm speaking in French now. Okay. I, 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 um, et ça c'était les questions sur ta présentation. So, the, the, la question c'est, Comment les résultats de la recherche ont influencé les décisions de programmation? Comment on peut utiliser ces résultats pour influencer nos programmes euh, au Burkina Faso? OK. Donc, je pense que ça, peut-être qu'on peut, on peut voir la question à plusieurs niveaux. Je parlerai, bon, Christelle et puis Élise, éventuellement aussi, vous pourriez euh, compléter. Alors, s'agissant par exemple de ce qui est de la redevabilité, d'abord, je prends le, le, les cas concrets hein, sur la, la manière, par exemple, n'est-ce pas, de, 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 sur la, les questions du ciblage. Il est évident qu'aujourd'hui, euh, voilà, on, on ne peut plus faire le, le ciblage comme euh, de par le passé. Il est évident que toutes les structures qui font du ciblage, par exemple, n'est-ce pas, vont être obligées, en tout cas, de prendre, par exemple, en compte ce que les enfants ont dit. Ça, c'est une première chose euh, très concrète. Ensuite, toujours aussi sur la question de la, de la redevabilité. Vous voyez, on met en place des mécanismes de gestion des plaintes, mais c'était des mécanismes de gestion qui, pas, qui ne prenaient pas en compte les besoins des enfants, ou bien, n'est-ce pas, qui n'étaient pas adaptés aux enfants. Et ça aussi, donc, euh, avec, n'est-ce pas, les, les, la dynamique nationale qui est actuellement en cours, ce sont des aspects qui vont être aussi pris en compte. Alors, troisième chose, euh, un peu par rapport, justement, euh, chaque cluster, pour dire, euh, Elise complétera, Aujourd'hui, par exemple, n'est-ce pas, tous les clusters sont demandeurs de ces résultats-là. Et on s'imagine que si les clusters demandent ces résultats, c'est pour voir comment, en fait, n'est-ce pas, les mettre vraiment en pratique chaque par secteur. Donc, pour nous, l'impact, le changement que ça va induire là, il sera très, très important en termes de changement. D'abord, les dynamiques c'est-à-dire la manière même de percevoir les choses et la place qu'on donnerait aux enfants, et aussi en termes, en fait, n'est-ce pas, d'action concrète, c'est-à-dire au quotidien, n'est-ce pas, de, des ONG qui interviennent dans l'aide humanitaire. Merci. 
Merci beaucoup, Bruno. Thank you, Bruno. Yeah, um, I guess we're waiting for more questions from you guys, but I, I, I can take this opportunity to just like say, um, to mention something that Serena actually said about child participation in child safeguarding. You know, uh, one of the reasons that organizations actually do not uh, account for children, they've been using child safeguarding as an excuse. It's been used as an excuse to actually not account to children or for children, to the children, basically. Um, I think it's very important for all of us to note that child participation is actually part of child safeguarding. We should actually just note that into ourselves whenever we are <laughs> we're in organizational meetings. We should remember that child participation is part of child safeguarding. In fact, it is key to child safeguarding. Yeah, I thought I should mention. Uh, also, just a bit, I'm waiting for you guys to text the questions. You know, like the best thing you guys could do right now is just send the questions, send the reactions, but also just mention something that Joanna said. Uh, this was pretty cool. This was really cool. Like we should work step by step, decision by decision and response by response. You know, that, that, for me, that was like pretty, pretty cool. Brian, may yeah. in the absence of questions from the audience, may I ask you a question? Because you are so yeah. you're 18, you're from Kenya, you are a you've you've just aged out of childhood. Um, <laughs> yeah. but you you know, you, your memories are more recent than than mine, certainly, and many of us in the room, um, uh, of being a child. Um, and you've also, as a child, you also did a lot of work with other children in Kenya, some of those who lived in what we would describe as humanitarian context, some of the refugee yeah. camps, such as Kakuma, etc. So maybe my question to you, you know, you've, you're, um, you're hearing a lot of the adults from the humanitarian space and the child protection space speak about, you know, what accountability, you know, what changes we need to make to be more accountable to children in these contexts. Does it, what does this mean to you based on your experience of working with children um, and, of, you know, of consulting with them or as a journalist of maybe, you know, hearing their stories about their lives? What does accountability, like, what would it, what would it mean to make accountability real for them based on the stories that they've told you? You know, Christine, that's actually the main reason why I mentioned what uh, Jean said, the step-by-step -step decision by decision and response by response system. Because uh, Christine is right. I have been in the child sector for a bit. Uh, I was just a child, you know, like some few days ago, but now I'm, I'm, I'm an adult, so yeah. But uh, we've tried different methods of trying to be accountable to children. And when you look at like different formulas, different systems, you, it's all like, breaks down to the basic thing. Do these children actually even understand what you're doing you know, as a humanitarian? Do they actually understand what you're trying to achieve in this particular place? You know, it is impossible to be accountable to someone who does not even know what you're being accountable for. So it, only, it always breaks down to fast uh, bits, which is the most simplest, something that you'd expect everyone to just know, but surprisingly, they don't, at least most organizations don't. They don't inform humanitarian action. They don't elaborate. They just do, uh, which actually takes away the concept of sustainability when, it, when you look at it. But yes, it starts by that. After you've then informed them, we go back to Joanne's system. That is why I said it's pretty awesome. Step by step, you tell kids exactly what it is, you know, uh, and then decision by decision. This I'm not taking this as what you'd expect. Uh, how, how I'm analyzing this is not decision after decision, more of decision with decision. Like you're making these decisions mm. with the children, with their parents, because uh, it's difficult to take our children from their parents. Mm. It's absurd. But yeah. yes, decision by decision and then response by response. Organizations have a problem whenever they are doing anything that is entrenched in child participation, they forget to wait for the response. They will uh, come there, do their elaborations, their trainings, their, their whatever. But when it comes to actually waiting for the feedback, they will either manipulate the feedback to get the feedback they would expect to get. That is the results of the training that they had made, but not actually wait to hear from the children, not wait to see the initiative of these children come up. Because here's the truth. Children are very playful. And there's a, there's a quote that my mentor, Daniel, likes to say, the only work that children should do is play. Problem is, it's usually exploited. The only work that children do is play, but 
they actually they're brilliant man we are brilliant well we, we were brilliant I I think you we are brilliant. you are certainly and i think it's very it's, it's, a, it's an invitation i think for all of us what you're saying brian with such honesty is an invitation for us to be self-critical and reflective about our own practices um you know there are, yes there is manipulation there is tokenism and child participation yeah. i think all of us as organizations need to you know be thinking about how we can you know minimize you know eliminate this really in our practices um i wanted to also um uh, I ask, uh, so I see one more uh, question in the chat and ask if any of our panelists want to come in on that. I also realize we're running a bit behind time, but we, we have a really important announcement to make at the end of this session. So I'm going to ask if any of our panelists want to come in for this uh, question that's been put in by Zudi. Uh, ap apologies for your um, mispronouncing your name, um, how we're engaging with families and communities. Um, did Serena or Joanna, anyone want to take that? Uh, I can tell you what we are doing at the Global Education Cluster. My focus is really on involving as many children as possible, at least at the consultation level, the most basic uh, form of child participation. Um, this is because we have uh, had probably for too long a tendency to consult uh, adults on what our educational or child protection need uh, of children. So um, the message that I'm trying to promote uh, through my work at the Global Education Cluster is that yes, we have to consult adults on educational uh, needs, priorities and challenges, but at the same level, we should also consult with uh, children. Um, so there are a number of teachers that are customarily for example, consulted in, um, in education assessments or other forms of consultations. And my, my role is really to promote more participation of children, which wasn't happening uh, before. Thank you so much, Serena, for that. Um, uh, we really do need to wrap up this session because we're we're risking going over time, um, and we have an important announcement. Um, so, um, I'm thank you so much for this rich discussion, and actually, in which I also then ended up interviewing a, one of the moderators as a as a participant. We call this participant observation in anthropology, and with that, I would like to. Um, uh, hand the floor to Camilla to from the Alliance Secretariat to share with us some exciting news before Brian will wrap us up. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, everyone. I'll be very, very quick. So, um, as you will have heard from Kristen at the beginning, accountability to children is one of our strategic priorities in this period. And you have really been unpacking that in the session today. Um, it's been fantastic to hear about, or well, see you demonstrating this leadership and talking about the meaningful action that we need to take. It's more than just complaints and feedback mechanisms. I think we kind of got to complaints and feedback mechanisms in our annual meeting last year. And now we've really looked a lot more broadly about how we can look at accountability to children and child participation across the programme cycle, across all sectors, um, and including what children say that they need, not just what we think they, they need. Um, so I won't say any more about this, but I did want to invite you to join us on the next slide um, in our accountability advisory group. So this session has really been brought together by the nascent accountability advisory group. A lot of the panelists that you've seen and engaged with today are people who will be joining that group alongside others within the Alliance. Um, this group will be set up to really advise the Alliance um, and provide technical, a technical sounding board to the Alliance as we implement the strategy, um, ensuring that we achieve the goal um, of accountability to children as set out by the strategy, uh, but also helping us to make strategic decisions and be well represented in strategic um, bodies on accountability to children. So Kristen's going to share the link um, to an expression of interest form if you would like to join us. Otherwise, just be assured that we will have this group, we will be continuing to do this work, and that you can reach out to us via the Secretariat if you'd like information on it, or if you recommend someone that we should be reaching out to, or an initiative that we should be reaching out to, 
um, as we progress this advisory group. And in case you're in any doubt about joining or the relevance of the group, the next slide will just give you a very quick rundown of some of the areas of work that um, our different working groups, task forces within the Alliance are taking forward over the next two, three years as we implement the strategy, and some that the advisory group members themselves have said that they want to take forward. So I'll just leave that up there for a moment um, for you to look at while Kristen or Bri I think Brian closes us out. So over to you, Brian, and thank you so much for all the energy and passion you've brought to this session, Brian. Thank you so much, Camilla. Just a bit of correction. The energy was already here. This topic in itself is beautiful and amazing. And that's actually why I'm very passionate about it. Now, remember, guys, when we started, I asked you guys a question about accountability, and you had to reply with a scale of one to five. I saw some good responses. I saw some twos. I didn't see a one, which is good. Uh, but so mostly it was three and four, right? Um, the fours were people who were afraid to say five because they were not really sure themselves, which is okay. But now, after after now we're done with all this, after our beautiful session, after hearing from our amazing panel, our keynote speakers, me, you know, <laughs> Christy, and everyone else who's been part of the session, I just want to ask you guys to, you know, reflect, to just reflect on the challenge you shared at the beginning. And what what sort of learning, like what learning would you take forward to take action on this topic? You know, the key point there being to take action on this topic. The, the, the main purpose of this session right now, we're just finishing, by the way, almost done. But I want you to just reflect, you know, reflect on the challenge you shared. The challenge you shared. Remember, the second question was the sort of challenges that prevent you to be accountable. Now, after all this, reflect on this challenge and what kind of action, what have you learned that is going to enable the kind of action that you're going to be taking? I'm just going to give you a few minutes because mine was to ask you guys to reflect on this, reflect on everything we've talked about, everything we've learned, everything we've had, everything we've said, you know, all that. And just to ask you guys to reflect and share what sort of learnings will you take forward for the action just feel free to share i am glad i see we around 40 people here just share share that little snippet of something that they're going to say because the purpose of this was to influence action was to educate you and enable you to actually take action and we are very so <laughs> just to reflect and share and to remind all of you here that everyone here is going to one way or another influence and take action to be accountable to children remember all of you i know most of you are experts when it comes to children matters but when it comes to real children matters like children in matters you're not experts at all you're not children after all so <laughs> it's about time you learn that's why we, but, we open the floor to children and young people to to teach us as well because we have a lot to learn do we have any results coming through through that mentee i don't know if the producers are able to share if there's anything coming through um we really would love to hear your any concluding. Ah, here we go. Here's some concluding thoughts. Someone says that they're going to moving and there's willingness to make a change. Wonderful. Would anyone else like to share their thoughts about what learning you take forward? I think it should be everyone. Everyone just share your thoughts, you know? It's very important. And I think willingness, willingness is the is, is key here. <laughs> We have someone in the chat who said, allowing children to be part of the change. That's fantastic. Ensuring children's participation in all of the steps of project cycle management. Yeah, that's a great start as well. There's so there's so much that needs to be done. Yep. I think that we're gonna have to wrap up, Brian. So last words from you, and then I'll say our last words. Yeah, I think I just forgot to mention that when it comes to accountability to children, it's also important to collaborate and be open with each other as organizations so that we can share feedback and keep each other in check. But yeah, I think mean, that will be the final words from me. It's been amazing and I love this session. So yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and many thanks to all of our speakers and to all of our panelists and all of our participants and to the producers. Um, we, we've gone over by five minutes and to our interpreters who are doing a fantastic job. Thanks to you all. Mm -hmm.